So yeah, my name's Chris Allison. I think I'll struggle to live up to that billing, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Um, yes, as Ian said, I've been, I've been involved with this race since 2005, and my involvement in 2005 was substantially academic. Uh, because as far as I'm aware, that was your most hazardous year, with the, the most of the issues I'm about to speak about, when most of them happened. Uh, for some reason, uh, I, uh, I can't give an explanation, prior to that the race seemed to have gone quite smoothly, uh, and uh, I hesitate to say, but since then, substantially the race has gone quite smoothly. So I hope 2005 remains an exceptional year, but um, I don't think anyone need think that uh, serious problems don't arise from long distance running. And um, whether you think Pheidippides is uh, fact or fiction, the concept that you can come a cropper from running a long way is clearly well established. And uh, if you look at the cases on the right hand side, uh, that situation in events worldwide hasn't changed hugely. So I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour through some of these things, not to try and put you off, uh, off your thing, um, but uh, we can't pretend that these things uh, don't happen. So uh, I'm going to categorise the events for tonight uh, as per that slide there. But uh, essentially disorders uh, affect your body generally uh, or they can affect a localised area. Uh, and in terms of the general disorders, I'm going to divide them into sudden death, which for all intents and purposes is sudden cardiac death, extreme variations of normal, which may look abnormal but probably aren't, and then uh, abnormal. Uh, conditions or disease states. Uh, and if I've got time, I'll mention some of the localised conditions which aren't inconsequential but uh, are not at least life threatening. So, if we talk about sudden death, um, uh, then as I said, we we're talking about sudden cardiac death, which is fortunately rare, uh, but there have been some high profile cases. Um, there's two of them on there from recent times. Uh, and if you're interested in that kind of thing, broadly speaking, the, uh, the causes of your sudden cardiac event are uh, divided two ways, governed by your age. And if you're under 35, um, uh, as per this uh, unfortunate Cameroonian footballer here, then if you, uh, if you have a sudden cardiac arrest, it's likely to be due to some, in, some hereditary cardiac defect. Obviously, there was a high profile case recently, and I'm glad to say he's like. Um, if you're over 35 and have a sudden cardiac event, it's, it's because you, your arteries are clogged and, and you've had a, a, it follows a heart attack. So um, my recommendation there is if you know yourself to have diseased coronaries, maybe this isn't the run for you. <laughs> where's the new Just the right hand button. It's up there. Where's the, where is it's it? Up, up there. No, up the top there. <laughs> it's not moving. Okay. Uh -huh. Will it go backwards? No, it's stuck. Okay, I'll just go. <laughs> and all was going so well. So, are you, uh, that all seems fine now? Okay. So, moving on from sudden cardiac death, we'll have a brief talk about the, uh, the manifestations of uh, extreme uh, normality. And this is, this is by far and away the commonest. The commonest uh, significant problem that anyone looking after uh, long distance uh, runners will encounter, which is, it's got its long fancy name, exercise associated postural hypertension. But all it is, is a sudden fainting shortly after uh, discontinuation of running. Uh, the explanation is relatively simple, that, uh, that uh, blood is kept circulating by the pump of the active muscle, uh, and then if you stop running, the muscle activity uh, abruptly discontinues, and the circulation or the, uh, the restoration of blood uh, from the return of blood from the legs to the heart for pumping in the next heartbeat doesn't happen and you faint. Um, so there are certain requirements to make that condition. Uh, one is that you cross the line feeling well uh, uh, and have no symptoms prior to that. 
and the other is that this, this eventuality happens relatively shortly uh, after completion. So if you, if you collapse while you're exerting yourself, or if you collapse significantly after uh, completion of exertion, then it's likely not to be this. But most people, uh, they, if they're going to have this phenomenon, it happens within a few minutes of finishing running or completion of the stage. And if you spend any time near the finish, you'll see at least half a dozen of these every race, uh, as you do in every, in every long distance run. Uh, and a a more, a more of a meal is made of this than needs to be. <coughs> Recognize that's what it is, uh, by the exclusion of any, of, any, of any problem during the race. And leave the folk uh, where they lie with their feet up and wait for them to come to. Um, so uh, if that happens at the end of, at the end of, a, of a stage, uh, then there's no reason why the individual, once they've come to, can't get up and run on and proceed to the next stage. So uh, the commonest thing, normal variation of uh, physiology, uh, under-recognized uh, under and over-treated. Here's another uh, variation of normal, which is a rise in core temperature. And usually the people whose temperature rise like this are not even aware that it's happened. But as you can see from the, uh, the figures there, which come from, uh, from Bern 2006, the Singapore Half Marathon, quite a few of those uh, runners by the end of the half marathon had temperatures, core temperatures over 40 degrees, which you might think was a feature of heat stroke. But there's more to heat stroke, as you'll hear later, than just a rise in temperature. So these are people whose core temperatures have risen uh, and are quite well. Now, uh, you're less likely to encounter that in the West, the West Highland Way race because the, the ingredients uh, required to raise the core temperature uh, are, first of all, uh, um, the bulk of the athlete, and I accept that most West Highland Way runners are bigger than the average Singaporean. So, uh, so that contributes uh, to temperature uh, rising. But um, against temperature rise in the West Highland Way race, uh, first of all, the, uh, the temperate Scottish climate uh, and secondly, that the intensity of effort, because you are running for, for more than 30 hours, the intensity of effort at any, at any one time is, is less. So you're unlikely to see those rises in core temperatures that you might see in a half marathon runner in Singapore. But the, the take home message is that your core temperature can rise uh, as part of a normal uh, response to running uh, and it's of no uh, disease significance. The next variation of normal is muscle breakdown. Um, so in 2009, uh, three of us measured the muscle breakdown enzyme, creatinine kinase, CK, uh, of, of, of 67 uh, finishers who finished quite well. Uh, now the, the cutoff for normal uh, creatinine kinase is 200. So as you can see, every single uh, finisher had a significantly raised creatinine kinase, and yet they were all well. So, uh, and this, is, this phenomenon has been described in, in, in other races. So, a degree of breakdown of your muscles uh, is universal in every finisher. And I've now got used to that. And if that's all you've got, and there are no problems associated with it, then I call that a variation of normal, uh, and I, I'm now no longer bothered. But if you return whence you came to, to your city uh, GP, and you go on a Monday morning feeling a bit rough, and he draws some blood off you and sees that you have a creatinine kinase of 130,000, he will be very uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> but I'm happy to take calls, because uh, if nothing else is wrong, and you've got the understandable aches and pains of having done what you've done, and the only biochemical abnormality is a high CK, and it takes some weeks for that to settle down uh, to normal, then, uh, then I don't think that's any big deal. So, once again, I put rhabdomyolysis without complications on my list of normal variants. Uh, uh, stuck again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to put a man up there. <laughs> Are we all right with terminology so far? Nobody lost. Okay, the last, the last of the normal variants is weight loss uh, and uh, a certain amount of loss of weight during the event uh, is, is, is common 
uh, and I uh, hazard to say that it's normal. So I expect, I expect pe most people to lose some weight. And, and here are the, uh, the weight changes uh, of those, that same uh, 66 finishers from 2009. And as you can see, the best fit line for the 66 um, people's weight loss is just below uh, 2%. So does that, um, does that graph make sense to people? Just, I just plotted the weight loss, uh, percent weight loss, down that side there, uh, of everybody who finished. And you can see that the, the, the best fit line sits just below 2%. And that corresponds with what people will report elsewhere. Uh, and I think that's normal. Uh, as, do, as do most others, um, and we'll move on, and I hesita hesi uh, hesitate to say uh, that not only is it normal, it's also desirable. So if you plot weight loss against finishing time, whether it's the West Highland Way Race in 2009, or South Africa Ironman 2001 and 2002, you'll see that the, if you plot uh, weight loss against finishing time, those people who lose the most weight have the shortest finishing time, i.e. finish the quickest. I'm slightly holding back from, ad, uh, from recommending that you lose weight in order to do well. So <laughs> I'm cautious with my wording. But uh, if, you, if you stay with me for the rest of the talk, you'll appreciate that I think weight takes care of itself. Uh, you just drink what you feel you need to drink, and weight will do what weight will do, and I think you will be fine. So I don't think people down at this end in the West Island Way Race or that end of the South African Ironman were consciously fluid depleting themselves. They drank what they felt they needed um, based on thirst. They lost weight, they didn't come to any harm, and substantially had decent finishing times. So weight loss is normal. Weight loss may be desirable in that it's associated with a favorable finishing time. And weight loss is protective. I'm sorry that the direction of the weight change, i.e. the weight gainers and the weight losers, is the opposite way around from the previous graph. And I'm sorry there's so much writing on it. But I'll just bring your attention to this mass of dots here, which is most people. And as you can see, uh, this is, these are notice figures from Cape Town, that he, he regards people who, whose weight changes between no change and 3% loss as normally hydrated. So he doesn't consider you are dehydrated until you're, for the purposes of this graph, until you've lost 3% of your starting weight. So I hope that supports what I've said, that essentially a loss of between 2 and 4% uh, of weight is normal. So he doesn't, he doesn't consider that you start to become dehydrated until you're 3% down on your starting weight. And as you can see, this great watch of people who lose from their starting weight and, and straddle the, uh, the uh, U-hydration, normal hydration, dehydration line, uh, also maintain normal sodium, okay? So weight loss is normal. Weight loss seems to be associated with a, with a better finishing time, and the degree of weight loss is associated with protection of normal sodium levels. So, on the subject of sodium levels, we've moved on, we've spoken about sudden death, we've spoken about variations in normal, and I'm now going to finish off talking about disease states. So when your sodium level drops to below 135, that then becomes an abnormal situation. And it's important that you appreciate that the cause for a sodium falling is not because you've sweated salt, okay? It's because you've, got, you've ingested and retained too much fluid. Uh, and that makes uh, the prevention of a low sodium substantially in your own hands. And it's governed by your, your, your fluid drinking schedule. So I recommend that you heed that and drink by thirst rather than any sense of so much time has passed and therefore you have to imbibe so much fluid. The problem with, uh, with the low sodium is that the symptoms initially is that the sodium is only mildly low, uh, the symptoms are themselves mild. But as the sodium tumbles below 130, then the pro symptom progression moves on from, uh, from confusion, fits, coma, and death. There are a few others, but that's, that's the progression, and the, there have been a, uh, a few deaths from this. Um, it happens. 13% of, of runners in the, in the Boston Marathon were found to have low sodiums, uh, although fortunately in the majority of them, the degree of, uh, of depression in sodium wasn't so great as to make them particularly unwell. There's a group of risk factors which dispose you to developing a low sodium, of which the main one is drinking more than you need. So if you drink more than you need, 
gain weight, you're female, uh, you're one of the slower runners, and it's an event which lasts more than four hours, which clearly the West Highland Way race does, uh, and you're consuming anti-inflammatory medications, those are a hodgepodge of risk factors which dispose to the development of EAH. As I've mentioned, it's substantially avoidable. I don't give any guarantees, but if you remain in the category of weight losers, around that 3% mark, stay off the anti-inflammatories, and maybe monitor your weight during the race, um, then your, your chances of avoidance of, of, a, of a disease state low sodium are, are good. Um, and uh, although we've said 13% in the Boston Marathon, countries where they are more signed up to the, uh, to the uh, fluid restriction side of things, like New Zealand and South Africa, the incidence is lower. So um, here are some finishing sodiums from the 2009 uh, West Highland Way race. And if you remember, normal sodium is between 135 and 145. You'll see that there are no low sodiums in the West Highland Way finishes of 2009, apart from that one. And uh, what you can't tell from that, because it isn't shown, but what I know is that we measured everyone's electrolytes uh, before the start of the race, and that same runner had a low sodium there. So I can't remember what the reason for the low sodium was, but it wasn't anything to do with the race. So if you take that one out, because it's, it's not a fudge, that's, that one is not an EAH, but everybody's sodium uh, was above the, uh, the um, lower limit of normal. We've got one or two whose sodiums are slightly above the upper limit of normal, uh, four, well, it's four actually, four high sodiums, and that's of no consequence. So uh, if you compare that with the same study done from 47 finishers, uh, study done by our friend and colleague in the United States on the Western States Endurance Run, can you see that the, 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 kind of the average sodium is significantly lower in, in an American run than it is in, in the West Highland Way race? Uh, and uh, this is not the time and place to explain why I think those differences exist, although I hope one of the reasons for the difference is evenings like this. So I'll give you the message and you do what you're told. <laughs>